Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video we will learn all about calcium channel blockers. This is the only video you will need for calcium channel blockers. I will cover the mechanism of action, side effects, indications, and other important facts. Before I begin, I just wanted to show my appreciation to you all for the endless support. I'm so grateful to have this platform to do what I love. I hope you learned a thing or two from this video, and if you do, please hit the like button and also follow me on these social media platforms below. Thank you. Calcium channel blockers refer to drugs that bind to the calcium channel receptors and inhibit it. They can be divided into two main categories, the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. In terms of the chemical structure, one has this dihydropyridine ring and the other doesn't. This contrast is also the reason why their mechanism are different and why we use them for different indications. Calcium channel blockers bind to the L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. L-type meaning it's long-acting and voltage-gated meaning that this channel only opens and closes in response to changes in the cell's electrical voltage or action potential. This phenomenon plays an important role in cardiac cells, the smooth muscles that line the blood vessels and skeletal muscles. So yes, voltage calcium channels can be found in all of these locations. So the channel is normally closed, but when it's triggered by an action potential, it opens up and then there's an influx of calcium into the cell. In the heart, the calcium helps increase the contractility and the heart rates. In the smooth muscle of the blood vessel, it promotes vasoconstriction. And in the skeletal muscle, calcium is important for contraction of the muscle. So when a patient takes a calcium channel blocker, it blocks this channel and prevents calcium from moving into the cells. So if this is what we see in the normal circumstances, then after blocking this channel, we will get decreased contractility and heart rate, and in the blood vessels, we will have vasodilation. The skeletal muscle effect is not as important in clinical practice, so I will not focus on this. In general, calcium channel blockers follow this mechanism discussed here, but they are not all the same. Remember previously, I mentioned that there are two main categories, dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. The dihydropyridines act Activity is mainly in the blood vessels, so they are known as peripheral vasodilators, while the non-dihydropyridines activity is mainly in the heart, so they slow the heart rates and contractility. Examples of the dihydropyridines are here for your information. Take note that the dihydropyridines all end in enes, just like dihydropyridine. Examples of the non-dihydropyridines are here for your information. Diltizem specifically also has moderate vasodilatory effects. If the mechanism of action was clear to you, then you should be able to give me examples of some indications of calcium channel blockers. Most common ones are hypertension due to the peripheral vasodilation. So of course, the dihydropyridines are the go-to in this case. Angina, and that's because the non-dihydropyridines can reduce oxygen demand on the heart and ease the chest pain. In arrhythmias, where the rate control is the go, the non-dihydropyridines can reduce the heart rate. They are categorized as as class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs. Other uses include migraines, Raynaud's phenomenon, a condition that causes decreased blood flow to the fingers, subarachnoid hemorrhages, or bleeding into the space between the brain and the skull. Calcium channel blockers in this case have been shown to counteract the narrowing of blood vessels after the subarachnoid hemorrhage and to protect the brain against periods of ischemia. And lastly, pulmonary hypertension. So now that we know which patients we can prescribe these medications for, it's time for us to learn about the side effects so we could counsel our patients. Since the two category of calcium channel blockers are different in terms of where they elicit their therapeutic effect, the side effects may be slightly different also. So let's separate them here. The dihydropyridines and then the non-dihydropyridines. For the dihydropyridines, the side effects include headache, flushing, dizziness, and edema. And for the non-dihydropyridines, the side effects include constipation, fatigue, bradycardia, and decreased cardiac outputs. Aside from the adverse effects, there are other important information we should know as clinicians, and these are known as clinical pearls. Since calcium channel blockers are metabolized through the CYP450 enzyme pathway, there is going to be potential for drug-drug interactions. Always assess for this when verifying orders for calcium channel blockers. Also, please counsel the patient to avoid grapefruit juice, 
and to inform your physician or pharmacist before starting any new medications, including over-the-counter drugs and vitamins. Always check for the renal and hepatic dose adjustments, since some of these agents do require it. The dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers may be used to manage hypertension in pregnancy, but always do your due diligence to check for any updated information regarding use of any medication in pregnancy before you verify and dispense it. Next, calcium channel blockers may cause gingival hyperplasia, which is a condition that refers to an overgrowth of the gums. The prevalence ranges from 30 to 50 percent of patients who use these medications long term. The dihydropyridines tend to be more commonly associated with this complication, and there has been many suggested mechanisms, with one being an increase in the levels of testosterone, which promotes the hyperplasia. Please remember to counsel patients to maintain good dental hygiene while while on these meds. Next, the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers may cause a reflex tachycardia, and this is due to the vasodilation that may trigger the baroreceptors in the blood vessels, which will lead to sympathetic nervous system activation. So because of this, the dihydropyridines may be less desirable in patients who have angina. Next, when calcium channel blockers are used in hypertension, it can be used for patients who have hypertension without comorbidities or those with hypertension and comorbidities such as CKD, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, etc. It's usually used in combination with ACE inhibitors and ARBs and or diuretics. And that will be the end of this video. I love you all seriously. And once again, I'm so grateful to have this platform to do what I love. If you learned at least one thing, I would appreciate it if you could hit the like button, subscribe and leave all your comments down below. Also follow me on these social media platforms below especially my TikTok. I just made it and I'm trying to get my followers up. Thank you again for watching this video and take care.